Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. It was July of 2009 that my wife, Hilda, and I had gone to spend a week in Mount Revelstoke National Park to take in a little relaxation and some hiking. We had prepared our vacation around the summer months when the alpine meadows are in full bloom, being carpeted with yellow arnica, asters, blue lupine, scarlet paintbrush, and the white valerians. It very much reminds us of our youth in Germany. We had begun our day's hike from the campground near the Lindmark Trail, our destination being the meadow atop Revelstoke at some 6,300 feet. On the lower slope, we were making our way through the mountain ash, green elders, wild cherries, red and black elders, and black cottonwoods interspersed with all these huckleberries, blueberries, and salmonberry bushes, which attract quite a few bears, so you must be careful. As you ascend the slope, the Douglas fir, giant cedar, and white pine start to take over. After some four or five thousand feet, it is the Engelmann spruce and alpine firs that dominate the landscape. Having made the summit, we had entered into what is a rolling alpine meadow, with Mount Tilly and Mount Mackenzie being in full view in the distance. Bruce and firs are scattered in patches and small groupings here at the summit. We had sat down on some small boulders for a well-needed rest after the climb. I think we had been sitting for maybe half an hour in the sun when Hilda pointed out to me that one of the spruce trees some two or three hundred yards away from our position was thrashing back and forth in a violent and most unusual fashion. We sat watching this for some ten minutes or so, fully expecting to see a bear emerge from the trees. When nothing of the sort happened, we continued to watch and wait. The tree having stopped shaking, Hilda and I decided to move a bit closer in hopes of seeing some type of wildlife in the trees. I think we had advanced perhaps 50 yards or so when a loud and what I will describe as a violent roar erupted from the grouping of trees directly ahead of us. This was the same patch where one of the trees had been shaking violently only minutes before. This roar was so loud that I could feel the pressure from it in my body, despite us being some 200 yards away from its origin. At least, that was my estimation at the time. Neither of us had ever heard a grisly roar, and we both believed that this was what in fact we heard. The roar had frozen us in our tracks, and we actually started to slowly retreat when a large, hairy beast on two legs came running out of the trees some fifty yards and stopped abruptly in the meadow. It was looking directly at us, flailing its arms around the air and thrashing its head and upper body back and forth while growling. The growl sounded more like a deep, guttural whine. The speed at which this beast had run 50 yards was so fast that, if it had continued, it would have been on us in a matter of seconds. That would have been our demise, for certain. I grabbed Hilda's hand, and we slowly started to back away, not wanting to startle the beast. 
As we did so, it made yet another fast charge towards us, once again stopping after some 20 or 30 yards. This charge was followed yet again by the growling and flailing of its arms and head just as it had done so on the first charge. The size of this thing was immense, and its actions told us that its intent was vicious, to say the least. The two of us kept slowly backing away as the beast was intermittently continuing to growl and throw its arms and head around in front of us. We had actually backed away some 75 yards or so when the two of us turned and started to walk. At first, our steps were slow and cautious, and then we quickened our pace, making it over the side of the meadow to head back down the slope of Revelstoke. As my wife and I made our descent from the meadow, we couldn't help thinking that this creature was going to follow us over the side at some point. We were on edge. Finally, we had reached the bottom, and when we were all clear of the trees, the two of us sat down for a well-deserved break and began to talk. Both of us now knew we had encountered a Bigfoot and thought that in some way, shape, or form, we had walked in on some type of activity it was planning in this meadow atop Revelstoke. We had become intruders in its territory and it wasn't happy about us being there, although it could have easily crossed the entire meadow and attacked us it didn't, which indicated to us that it was trying to scare us off. It had done one heck of a job in doing so. Being so far away from us, it is hard to say how big it really was, having nothing to measure it against. The thing that impressed me most was the depth of its roar. It had to have come from deep within the bowels of a very substantial beast indeed. The second thing was how quickly it was able to move with relative ease during both the charges towards us. It was able to cover a large amount of ground in what appeared to be six or eight very rapid steps. They appeared to be fast leaps that were very hard to distinguish separately. The succession of these leaps was so quick that to our eyes it seemed like a blur. However tall it may have been, its physique was that of a bodybuilder. It was fully covered in a reddish-brown hair that appeared to be somewhere between 4 and 10 inches long, depending on the area of the body you looked at. This encounter was so dramatic and life-changing, we just had to tell you about it. Seeing is certainly believing, and neither of us had really given much thought to the reality of their existence until that day in the meadow. How quickly things change. On to the next story. I'm from British Columbia, Canada, and I can tell you that Sasquatch is alive and well up there. The stories are plentiful. It seems like anyone who has spent much time in the outdoors in that area has had at least one or two encounters. I grew up there, and this story isn't the only one I could tell, but it's definitely the most dramatic. I grew up in the Bella Coola Valley, and Bella Coola sits on a huge inlet, Queen Charlotte Sound, and we have a lot of coastal weather, even though we're not actually on the coast. It's a wet climate with lots of rain and snow and the huge coast mountains towering over you wherever you go. Mount Nusatsum is one of the most prominent and reminds me of something you might see in the Himalayas with its pointed massive top. The people of Bella Coola region are pretty self-sufficient, and we're no strangers to wildlife. We even have grizzly bears wandering around, sometimes even in town. Seeing or hearing a Sasquatch up in that country isn't a huge big deal, as a number of people have seen them, although some people don't believe in them. But if they'd been with me, they would have for sure. I'm a bush pilot, though I don't haul people around for pay. But I've been flying in the bush since I was in my 20s. 
My dad was a pilot, and I guess such things are handed down, as my brother is also a pilot. If you wanted to get around in British Columbia, flying is the best way to go, as most of the province is wild and rugged with no roads. If you know how to land about anywhere, you have a whole new world opened up to you. Anyway, this event happened in 1996, quite some time back. I know it was 96 because I had just purchased a used Aviat Husky that year. It was the first and last summer I had it. If you know airplanes, the Husky is every bush pilot's dream airplane. It's similar to a Piper Cub, but can land and take off in literally only a few dozen feet. It's totally amazing. This is partly because it's so lightweight, and part of why it's so lightweight is because the fuselage has a welded steel frame that's covered with cloth. I had spent quite a fortune on this plane, and I was very proud of it. It was bright yellow along the bottom half and white on the top. I had toyed with the idea of getting floats put on it, but I didn't want to be restricted to waterways. Anyway, I could land this thing on a short sandbar if I wanted to be on the water, say for fishing, so I decided to forego the floats. The Husky can get you into places no other plane can go, except maybe a helicopter. Having this new, to me, airplane inspired me to get out and see some new country. I decided to go spend several days exploring and fishing some of the lakes near Tweedsmere Provincial Park. I'd go up to the north section of the park and land on the shores of Nichaco Reservoir and do some fishing for cutthroat trout and mountain whitefish. Even though I'd grown up close to that country, I'd never been there. I tried to talk my brother Will into going along, but he had too much work to do. So I geared up for a few days out. I was excited as I could be to try out my new husky. But I never made it to Nachaco, as a friend told me it was a bad place to go. He told me the shoreline has a forest of drowned trees and floating debris, and there's really no place to land. On top of that, sudden and strong winds funnel down from the coast mountain, making landing and taking off hazardous. Of course, this was true about anywhere in the area, but something about the long reservoir channels the winds even worse. So, I took off from the Bella Coola airport, scouting things out, not sure where I was going. I followed the Chicotan Highway up over the huge coast range, my little husky bravely climbing like a champ. We locals call the stretch that drops down into the Bella Coola Valley the hill, but others call it names I can't repeat. It's steep and narrow and scary. I decided I didn't want to get too far out, the area was too wild and rugged. I soon spotted an intriguing lake that was as blue as could be, that pale milky blue that a lot of Canadian lakes have from glacial till in the water. Glacial till is the soil eroded from glaciers and it gives the water an unreal color. It's beautiful, but it's also hard on water filters. But I just knew this lake would have some excellent trout as well as no people. I circled around it and saw no signs of anyone anywhere. It was a big bowl in the mountains. I would have the place all to myself, so I thought anyway. I found a little sandbar and had no trouble at all landing on it. I had practiced landing and taking off at the airport, but this was the real deal. If I came in too long, I'd be in the lake. I had noticed some logs and such on the sand, but managed to get around those with no trouble. I just sat there for a minute, totally elated. That darn husky could land as easily as it could take off, needing only 30 feet or so. This little plane was going to take me into places no other human had ever seen, or that I knew of. Anyway, I had flown the bush all my life, and never had I been able to land in a spot like this. I finally got out and walked around a bit. The weather forecast was good, 
and I had three wonderful days to myself. Just me and my little husky and the wilds of Canada. I got my gear and started fishing the first thing. I just kind of wandered along the lake, hoping to catch something for dinner, as it was now mid-afternoon. I had soon caught a beautiful cutthroat. I also caught an equally beautiful rainbow trout, which I released. I didn't think that this lake had ever been fished by another human. It was about as remote as you could get. I pitched my little tent not far along the shore from the plain, got settled, then made a small fire and cooked the trout with a little seasoning and some butter and lemon juice. I added some already cooked pasta I picked up from the store, then sat back and ate and felt like I finally found paradise. This was followed by a beer or two, then I wandered around the plain and took a ton of photos of it with the lake and the rugged mountains in the background. I was so proud of it. When you're in the north in the summer, it doesn't get dark until really late. I think it was about 11 p.m. when it was finally what I would call sleeping darkness. Not really dark, but close enough. I crawled into the little tent and listened to some kind of bird calling in the distance. I noted it seemed unusual to a birds at night, but not that unusual. I heard another one answer in the far distance, then I fell asleep. The next morning, I was awake at dawn, ready to go exploring. I had made some coffee and had a hot breakfast of eggs and bacon. I love camping out of a plane as I can carry about anything I want along, and I don't have to worry too much about animals getting into it. I then set about getting a small pack ready with lunch stuff and fishing gear. Before long, I was out, walking the lake perimeter, which had looked from the air to be about three miles around. I wanted to explore and check out where the water came from. It looked like it was fed by a good-sized creek that might prove to have some great fishing. I forgot to tell you what happened first thing when I got up. When I stepped out of my tent, I heard a crack sound that sounded like someone stepping on a large branch in two. It seemed to come from around the lake a bit, maybe a few hundred yards away, back in the deeper timber. It made me pause, because one has to always be aware of bears. I always carry a rifle, as do most people in the bush. But what was really weird about this was that every morning the same thing happened at exactly the same place. It was like someone was playing a recording. After the third morning of this, I was getting pretty leery. I can tell you that. And those damn birds, every night the same thing. One would sound off and another would answer from far away like clockwork just as I was settling into my tent. Anyway, I hiked around the lake that first day, or tried to, should I say. When I got to where the creek came in, there was a deep gorge that blocked my passage. I guess it wasn't really a gorge, just a little canyon. The water had gouged out, maybe 40 feet deep. So I had to turn around and go back the same way I'd come. I wasn't able to reach the creek to even try fishing there, so I went back to camp and fished off the beach again by the plain, and caught another fine trout. Who knows, maybe the one I caught and released the day before. I slept like a baby that night, after the bird calls had stopped, but the next morning, when I exited the tent and heard the crack again, it made me uncomfortable. I felt like someone was watching me. I sat there and had another fine breakfast, but the carefree feeling I'd had the previous day was gone. To be honest, I didn't feel like I was alone anymore. I listened for the sounds of other people, but heard nothing. I decided to kind of just hang around camp that day and relax. I would be leaving the next evening, and I wanted to hike around the lake in the other direction, but I would do it tomorrow. I was feeling out of sorts, and not just because of the strange crack noise. I had managed to put on some weight over the previous winter, and the hike the day before had left me a bit messed up. My knees hurt, my feet hurt, my legs were sore, and I was kind of upset with myself. I needed to lose about 30 pounds, and this trip had been the wake-up call. I wasn't as light on my feet as I wanted to be. 
I spent the day walking around the lake a bit, fishing, reading, drinking coffee, and just thinking about life to that day. Nothing serious, just planning out the summer and all that. I was 34 years old and wanted to change directions in life. I was tired of my job as a marketing guy for a Bella Coola tourist company. I wanted to get back to doing something I enjoyed. Problem was, I couldn't figure out what. That night was one of the most awesome and strange nights of my life in several ways. Number one, I was drifting off when I noticed something was weird outside. The evening light was different. I slipped out of the tent to the most amazing display of Aurora Borealis I've ever seen. A huge, undulating curtain of purples and reds was draped across the sky as far as the eye could see. I sat and watched it for several hours before I finally crawled back into my tent. But as I was climbing out to check the northern lights, that crack noise went off. It was almost like I triggered it with my arm when I opened the tent flap. I decided it was some sort of warning signal that I was coming out, and who or what was making it had to be watching me and able to see in the dim light, as this time it was dark. That didn't sit well with me. I almost went and slept in some plane, but it would be like sitting in a chair and trying to sleep. It even occurred to me to just take off and leave right then and there, but it was dark and there was no way one could take off that small sandbar in the dark. It was going to be challenging enough in the daylight and I needed to see where I was in order to circle and climb to avoid the mountains. When I crawled back into the tent, those damn night birds did their thing again. After that, I didn't sleep well at all, and I kept dreaming I was walking around in the thick Bella Coola forests, and there were monkeys everywhere. I would wake up, think I could hear them chattering, then drift back off again. The next day, sure enough, that crack sound again when I crawled out of the tent. I was sleep deprived and pretty much ready to leave right then. At that point, I was suspect I was in Sasquatch territory, and maybe not so welcome. I had never heard them harming anyone, but I didn't want to be around them, if that's what was going on. After breakfast, I packed up my tent and put everything into the plane. I had decided to leave early, not to wait for evening. But I just sat there for a while on a big log looking out at the peaceful lake and thinking about my life back home. And I decided I'd get some fish to take out with me. I would fish for an hour or so, then leave. I got my fishing gear and slowly began working my way around the lake a bit. It was a beautiful day and I was beginning to wake up a bit and lose my night fears. I noticed a flock of ravens coming in from the south. They seemed to notice me as they swooped down around a bit, looking at me, then went on their way. There were about 20 of them. I figured they were youngsters on a lark, as once ravens mate, they usually stay in their territory. I walked a bit and came upon a beautiful little glade at the edge of a deep forest. The forest of this part of BC are deep and thick and hard to navigate with lots of understory. The rains in the coast mountains are enough that it's more like a rainforest than an alpine forest, although on the drier side of the mountain. The forests quickly become alpine. I fished a bit where the glade came up to the lake and quickly caught half a dozen nice-sized trout. That was it. I had all I wanted and could go home any time now, but it seemed like the day was so beautiful and so nice and warm, and before I knew it, the night had caught up with me. I had dozed off in the sweet-smelling grass at the edge of that little pastoral glade. I woke up with a start. Something was in the bush nearby. I could hear a heavy thump, thump, like something beating a tree trunk. Now something bipedal was walking nearby in the woods, something heavy. I quickly jumped to my feet, grabbed my gear and my creel, and started back for the plane, trying hard not to run. Now something was paralleling me over in the edge of the woods. The faster I walked, the faster the steps beside me. I looked hard, actually hoping to see a grizzly, but I knew it had to be a Sasquatch with that heavy bipedal gait. I saw nothing, and the steps stopped the minute I did. I was getting winded from being so out of shape, and I hoped it didn't start chasing me, I would never make it. Now, as I headed back down the beach to that plane, the wood knocking started again, not far away in the thick trees. 
It was all I could do to not run. My rifle had been slung over my shoulder, but I now ditched my fishing gear so I could carry the rifle in my hands. The safety unlatched. This seemed to slow down whatever was following me, as it seemed to know what a gun was. As I finally got back to where I could see the plane, I was astounded to see ravens jumping around it and making a lot of noise. When I got closer, I could see they were all over the plane, pecking at the cloth covered. I had never dreamed birds would destroy my beautiful husky, never in a million years. I had heard of ravens pecking off windshield wipers and that sort of thing on cars, but never an airplane. They found something about the cloth interesting and had proceeded to go to pecking it full of holes, apparently making a big game out of it. At that point, I fired the rifle into the air and the ravens scattered everywhere. I ran up to the plane and what I saw made me want to cry. The fabric cover was full of holes, a good twenty or thirty, if not more. I was grounded. No way that plane was going anywhere. Of all the things to happen, and especially with a Sasquatch nearby, I suddenly felt a true, deep, gut-wrenching fear. I was now at their mercy. Once I ran out of ammo, I was helpless, and my rifle really wouldn't do much to a creature that large anyway. And, to make things worse, no one knew where I was. I had no radio contact, I was basically in a big bowl in the coast mountains, and I was in no shape to hike out. I was stunned. What a strange turn of events, from being all set to take off and go home to not being able to leave at all in just an hour or two. I got into the plane, and it felt odd, with light coming in through the holes in the fuselage. There was no way the plane was airworthy now. I just sat there. I soon noticed movement along the shoreline, maybe only a hundred feet or so away. Something was standing there, watching me. I started to panic. It was a Sasquatch, and it was making no effort to hide. But I still wasn't sure, as it was a golden color, and all the Sasquatch I'd heard of were brown or black. It could be a really large grizzly. It wasn't afraid of me, one bit, even with the rifle. Or maybe this one had never seen the rifle. After all, there had been several so-called birds doing those night calls. I felt beat. I leaned my head against the side window. It was then I noticed a little patch of duct tape I hadn't seen before, where the previous owner had taped something to the inside of the window, probably some kind of paperwork. Duct tape! I crawled into the back of the plane and opened my toolbox duct tape and hopefully enough to cover the holes. I pulled my fishing knife out of my pocket and set to work patching. Hopefully I had enough tape. When I was done, I crawled back into the cockpit. I had patched everything pretty tight, and I was sure I could now get out. But to my horror, straight ahead of the plane, exactly where I needed to take off, stood a huge creature, at least seven feet tall, it was the Sasquatch. I'd seen a bit earlier, but now that I could really make out what it was, it was terrifying, and it just stood there. It was a beautiful creature, amazing though frightening. It was pure golden color, and its hair was not matted, but it was very well groomed and shiny. The hair on its face was short and more of a beige color, and it had a large, flat nose. It had big eyes, and the look on its face was very intent, like it meant business. Oh man, I had to get out of there. I was no match for these guys, rifle or no. And the husky really wasn't like other airplanes. It had only the fabric skin, not aluminum like a regular plane. Not that even aluminum would have had much of a chance against these guys, but I had no protection even in the plane. I started the engine, the rotor starting turning while I pondered what to do. If the Sasquatch decided not to move, I could run it over and do some serious damage, but it would also mean the end of my rotor. I would then be stuck there, and if he had any friends, 
I now noticed movement in the far window. I leaned forward to see two more of these creatures coming from the edge of a thick forest towards the plain. Like the first one, they were golden, and their hair was so clean it shone in the sunlight. They would take a few huge strides towards me, then would stop. Each time they stopped, they seemed to completely disappear, which I found strange and baffling. But they were definitely moving in on me, and I had to go now. I pulled the stick back a bit and the plane started to slowly move forward, but then I stopped. I had no room here. I had to gun it and take off fast, or I would be in the water. That was the beauty of the husky. It allowed one to land and take off in very short spaces, and that's what I had to deal with, a very short space. Behind the Sasquatch was a big log, then the lake. I couldn't try to intimidate him by moving the plane closer. I would lose my takeoff space. The other two were now very close. A few more steps and they would be next to the plane. I thought about shooting at them, but even if my rifle would take one down, the others would be on me before I could defend myself. I still wasn't sure what they were up to. Did they mean to harm me or were they just curious? That's when I noticed my fishing creel on the seat next to me. It had been clipped to my belt, and I'd taken it off when I got into the plane and forgotten all about it. Even though I ditched my fishing gear, I still had the creel, and in it, six nice big rainbow trout. I opened my side window and took a big fish from the creel and tossed it as hard as I could towards the Sasquatch in front of me, but a bit towards the side. It looked at the fish, then took a few steps towards it and grabbed it. I took out two more and threw them towards the back of the plane, hoping the other two Sasquatch would go for them. Then I quickly threw the whole creel, remaining fish and all, towards the side of the plane where the first Sasquatch now was, eating the fish. As the beautiful golden Sasquatch stepped aside to grab the creel, I gunned the engine. I was in the air in seconds. A mere 30 feet of runway was all I needed, and I could see the Sasquatch looking at me, surprised as I climbed literally over its head. I'll never forget that, and its big, intelligent eyes stayed with me as I climbed and climbed. As I finally got enough altitude to break out and climb back to follow the highway, I noticed my hands were shaking. It was all I could do to just concentrate on getting back out, getting to the hill, and following the road back down to Bella Coola Valley. When I finally got back to the airport and landed, I called Will to come and get me. There was no way I could drive myself home, and I also didn't want to be alone. Will was fascinated by my story and wanted to know exactly where the lake was, but this was before things like Google Earth existed, and it was hard to pin down. I never did fly over it again or managed to locate it on a map, even though several people I talked to wanted to go down in there. I finally got my plane repaired to the tune of $15,000 as they had to completely redo the fabric cover. I then sold it and bought a Piper Cub, which meant I was going back to the old modus operandi of having to land where there was plenty of strip. But there was no way I was ever going to risk being grounded like that again. I did miss that husky. I didn't give up on fishing and getting out into the wilds, but I never went alone after that. And one thing all this did for me was make me think twice about the assumptions we all have about the world and what's out there. I can tell you one thing, we're not at the top of the food chain, that's for sure. And I did get a new career. I started a brewery. If you're ever in the Bella Coola Valley, you'll know it by all the Sasquatch names on the brews, as well as the Lost Lake Ale, made with pure glacial water and winner of several awards. The label has an artist's rendition of the Sasquatch eating my trout. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!